Welcome to Fantastic Places. And today I'd like to share with you a collection of more than 50 places around the world or other world that detail rarely shown magnificent natural and man-made wonders as unknown places that are off the beaten path like Rainbow Mountain in Peru. These places have been noted in National Geographic magazines and many NOVA or PBS nature shows. I believe in showing these wonders to you that will inspire and educate you to want to learn more about them. Like the Red River in Cusco, Cusco, Peru, where there's iron oxide in the water. That's why it's red. Many of these places were found accidentally by explorers or through satellite imagery and are far away from the cruise ship travel agency mentality that so dominates our culture, <laughs> like the world's largest spider web in Texas. Well, Today we'll start with the Cave of the Crystals in Chihuahua, Mexico, discovered in 2000. Hundreds of supersized crystals grow in a cave 1,000 feet below ground and are connected to a nearby mine. The tallest crystal is 36 feet long and weighs 55 tons. Just three miles underneath the surface is a giant pool of magma. Over the time, the caverns became flooded with groundwater that was rich in gypsum minerals. Mm -hmm. The magma acted like a cooker, and for 500,000 years, the area was slow baked and transformed <coughs> the minerals into huge translucent selenite crystals we see today. You can only spend about 10 minutes in the cave because the temperature is 150 degrees and it's 100% humidity. Therefore, one needs special protective clothing to wear. Imagine these crystals are the size of your kitchen and you would really feel small next to them if you were there. And again, this is in Mexico and looks like this. They have to wear special gloves when they uh, touch things. It, it, it's not good for the crystals. Next up and further south in Mexico is the Alimol fir forest where monarchs overwinter here by the tens of millions. These uh, butterflies migrate from Canada, let me take this from Canada, all the way down to Mexico over several generations coming down here thousands of miles. And they hibernate in winter here. These butterflies migrate from Canada to hibernate in the winter here. This is a cool forest nearly two miles above sea level. These monarchs have an ideal microclimate where tens of thousands of them can cluster on a single tree alone. And weighing in at a half ground, gram each, they would take 900 of them to equal one pound in weight. So that's quite a lot. Since so many congregate their weight in great tree branches, this dense canopy fir forest keeps them warm at night, retaining heat from the ground and acts as an umbrella from the rain, snow and wind. Therefore, every monarch you see has traveled hundreds of miles, taking a few generations to make their long distance trek. 85% of all monarchs have been uh, gone, and they're becoming an endangered species. That's what's going on. Next up, further south in South America, is Angel Falls in the Canamina National Park in Venezuela. It is the world's highest uninterrupted waterfall. Its height is 3,200 feet with an amazing plunge of 2,600 feet. And that's over a half mile. It was discovered by Europeans in 1937. The base of the waterfall is 450 feet wide and feeds into the nearby Karev River. These falls create their own weather and droplets can be felt at from a half mile away. And for the bit further south, uh, the Boiling River is in the Peruvian Amazon rainforest. It is a four mile long river that's up to 80 feet wide and 20 feet deep. It's a super, it is superheated by a geothermal underground vents, causing the water uh, to be between 120 and 196 degrees. In some parts, it actually boils, and any animals that fall into it are scalded to death. And it really is a steamy jungle. It is a tributary of the Amazon River and is a sacred place for rainforests. It is a sacred place for rainforest tribes of the area, and it has been left wild and un untamed. So you go by it, it's steamy, and this is what it looks like. And 
uh, speaking of the Amazon and further south, the people that live along the Amazon River in Brazil have a name for a tidal bore that sweeps violently upstream, and it's called the Pororoca, or Big Roar. One can hear this wave 30 minutes before it approaches and adventurous local people surf it. This event is triggered when the ocean tide is at its highest during the new and full moons during September, which we just had, and March biannual equinoxes. The sun, earth, and moon gravitational forces combined pull the pull of it brings ocean tides to their peak. Ocean water flows into the mouth of the Amazon where the river is shallow. Then the flow of the water reverses and the ocean water pushes upstream with incredible force against the flow of the river, producing a tidal bore. The river tsunami, this tsunami can travel 15 miles an hour and travel hundreds of miles upstream during the day. The waves can be up to 12 feet tall and last uh, a long time. Local people serve it. And uh, speaking of uh, South America, termite mounds can get up to 30 feet tall like in Australia or Africa. However, in northeast Brazil, uh, where the X is showing here, uh, right there, there is a termite colony that boggles the imagination. An estimated 200 million termite mounds of varying heights are spread out over 90,000 square miles there, almost the size of Great Britain. They are up to 4,000 years old and are made of a clay-like substance. Though most mounds are inactive, they are carbon dated between, to be between 4,000 and 700 years old. The mounds are uniformly 60 feet apart, and the soldiers of one of the largest termite species in the world created these mounds. These mounds are not nests, but the results of excavations and debris created by these termites while constructing miles of vast underground interconnected passageways and ventilation ducts for thousands of years. Since they feed on dead leaves that only drop once a year, the tunnels help them get quickly to their food source. Two and a half cubic miles of dirt and clay have been processed by these termites over time. That's a volume of 4,000 great pyramids of Giza and still might be growing. And staying with Brazil, the world's largest natural wetland is in the Pantanal region, mainly in southwest Brazil, right here, this green area. Uh, this covers some 55 to 75,000 square miles. This is a floodplain ecosystem where 2,000 different plant species, 463 bird species, 270 spe fish species, and 230 mammal species, and 9,000 invertebrate species live there. Some 80% of these floodplains are submerged during the rainy season, which also receives rain off, runoff from higher elevations and looks kind of like this. This vast sprawling area is also home to South America's most iconic animals like tapir, giant anteater, jaguar, black howler monkeys, macaws, capybaras, anaconda, iguana, egrets, and parrots. This swamp knocks your socks off. <laughs> now we're going to switch gears and go to Canada. And at the Wood Buffalo National Park in Alberta, Canada, there is the world's largest beaver dam. It actually goes a half mile. If you take a look at it, this is where the beaver dam goes, and it's a half mile right here. And when they do that, then they block up an area and create a different kind of environment, like a swamp area because it backs up the water. And discovered by satellite, it's an impressive 2,800 feet long. The dam stretches across a remote and isolated wetland area uh, right here in, in Alberta, shown here. And uh, it, had, it has ample fresh water and building materials. It began sometime in the 1970s, and it took numerous beaver generations to build. It's built of mud, branches, stones, twigs, and even has grass on top, meaning it's been there for a long while. And kind of, again, runs like this, or runs like this. So this is really a giant beaver mansion, or leave it to beaver on steroids. <laughs> And we're going to move on to China now and stay there a while talking about it. I'm sorry. 
There is a uh, 250 acre solar power farm in Daechong, China, it was built in the shape of a panda. It is called the Panda Power Plant, and it's a public relations attempt by China to showcase its uh, commitment to solar power. This plant uh, produces about 100 megawatts, but in the future it will produce 3 billion kilowatt hours, eliminating millions of tons of coal and thereby CO2 emissions. It's a clever marketing idea that can be seen from above. And I thought this was fascinating to see. This is a good attempt and a good way to, to show their, what they're doing out there. And China has some ideas. In, in Chengdu, China, there's an experimental green housing projects, which is really a vertical forest where hundreds of trees on balconies are grown to give back oxygen and CO2 uh, and take in carbon dioxide. It's a great idea to help our planet. And in 2016, China has built the, the largest uh, radio telescope southwest of Beijing. It's 1,600 feet wide, or a dish the size of 30 football fields and costs $180 million. It has 4,450 panels, and it's called the 500 meter Aperture Spherical Telescope, or FAST. They have one in, there in, in uh, a smaller version of this in Puerto Rico, but for the last two years, it's been knocked out because of the hurricanes there, and they haven't kept it up. This is where they send the messages from SETI, uh, uh, which is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence out, and they uh, send to other galaxies broadcasting ideas uh, from our planet and messages. And this is how it looks, this is how it's being made. This is the panel size. This is what it looks like. And they have a planetarium underneath doing this. This is state of the art. China is very involved in these kind of things. They are not a backwards nation anymore. And to go into that uh, a bit better, this is a map of the rocket launch sites in China. They have different rocket launch sites, and now they're very involved in the space race. They boast uh, control centers, launch pads, and have set up hundreds of satellites. Let's take a look at that. These are some of the satellites they've sent out in the recent years from these launch pads. And now they have a rover on the moon. They just put up a uh, space station with three astronauts, Chinese astronauts, put this together, and they stayed in there for about three months. So they're on the move. They're doing things uh, very progressively out there. Uh, staying in China, this is the Los Plateau. And I put this on for an environmental reason. It's a vast 250,000 square mile area that was overgrazed by goats and sheep for hundreds of years and really turned the area into a, a dry, barren, kind of a dust bowl wasteland. However, China decided to take action on this and Chinese workers terraformed the area by hand and they created terraces for hundreds of thousands of square miles like this to put back so they can grow crops and have uh, be able to retain the soil without being washed away and for their animals. And this is them working on this area here, the giant plateau area. So what, these are them working on the, what was left when it was dry and barren and it turned into this, a before and after. A before and after, and it looks like this. This is a great idea of conservation and I thought it was worthwhile to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, staying in China, over the last three decades, China has built hundreds of new cities to anticipate tremendous growth and to move some 300 million people from rural places to these cities. China, as we once knew, growing up was just a rural country. Now it's different. Quite often these newly minted cities that are satellites of larger cities nearby are ghost towns and boulevards of unrealized dreams. In a few year period, China used more concrete to build these cities than the U.S. did in the last century. People have not yet moved to these planned areas or have low occupancy rates as economic downturns, poor projected planning, overpriced housing units, pandemics, and promised large-scale factories or industries dried up. And it's a reluctance for some people to move here, uh, so it's made an eerie and surreal concrete jungle like you see here with no cars and no people. So China has spent trillions to transform this country into a marble, marble superculture 
Imagine no traffic, no congestion, no noise, and no people. What a bizarre place to live. The results are a bit mixed, but now you know what China does with its money. Now we're going to move to Ireland and visit Giant's Causeway on the northeast coast of Ireland. And, uh, and consists of 40,000 interlocking basalt columns. Most of these columns are hexagonal, and the tallest is 39 feet tall. The tops of the columns form stepping stones that lead from the cliff and un disappear under sea. 50 or 60 million years ago, streams of fiery molten rock erupted here, blanketing the area with lava for miles around. As the lava cooled rapidly, it contracted into these recognizable cylinder structures. Now you know where they get those paving blocks for your driveway. And we're going to move from Ireland and we're going to go to New Zealand. And uh, on New Zealand's North Island, that is the, there's two islands in New Zealand, north and south, this is the north. And it's a place called Rotora, or the top of volcanic zone. It's a tourist destination down under, as it's a place known for its geothermal activity. It boosts uh, geothermal hot springs, silica terraces, mud pools, many mud volcanoes, sulfuric pools, shooting geysers here. And uh, the Pohuno geyser erupts 20 times a day at a height of 100 feet. Kind of like uh, Yellowstone Park if you've been there. And Kaki Falls is the highest hot water fall in that area, 15 feet tall. Right next to it here is Devil's Bath, the green sulfur pool, right here. And you can take uh, these boardwalks, you can walk around, very much like uh, some of the national parks that have this. This is Inferno uh, Crater Lake, and it's made from, uh, the color comes from finely divided silica suspended in water there. Many of the bright pool, pools of green, blue, and yellow come from minerals and volcanic elements. This region is the youngest geothermal region in the world. It's over 10,000 years old. And we're going to stay in Australia and visit um, Lake Hillier, which is a pink saline lake down on the edge off Middle Island off the remote south coast of Western Australia. This lake is 2,000 feet long by 820 feet wide. And the only living organisms in Lake Hillier are microalgae, which causes the salt content in the lake to create a red dye. You, you can swim in it, but it's 10 times saltier than the ocean, and the entire lake is rimmed in a salty crust. It kind of looks like a pink margarita. <laughs> and it's located right here on the south part of the coast of southwestern Australia. And speaking of pink, this is a satellite shot of tens of thousands of pink flamingos. Being very gregarious, they flock together in massive groups as a safety measure against predators. Their pink color comes from their diet of pink keratoid uh, pigments, that is from shrimp, plankton, algae, and crustaceans. This is pink, seen from space. And speaking of birds, we're going to stop now at the uh, South Georgia Island in the South Atlantic way down here, not that far from the uh, Falkland Islands, further south from that. And this is where, uh, on this island, one million pink penguins live. The brown ones, by the way, are adolescents, and then they get their white coat. There are eight times more penguins here than the villages as people. <laughs> and we're going to move then to Canada. Mm -hmm. We talk about the Bay of Fundy, perhaps some of you have heard of this. It's between the Canadian provinces of New Brunswick to the north and Nova Scotia to the south. And it's, it contains the world's highest tides. The difference between high and low tide is 53 feet. I learned about this in college when I was uh, The tides are caused by the periodic rise and fall of the sea caused by the sun and the moon. The delta shape of the bay funnels water from the mouth of the bay to the head of the bay and back again in about 13 hours. This is before and after. This then creates a rocking motion which intensifies the amount and level of the weight of the water. So before and then after, before and then after the tide comes in. It's pretty significant. The tides, uh, the spring tides occur when the moon is closest to the earth and the tidal 
first flow in the one hour and 30 days. And speaking of tides, this is what again what it looks like. This is Mount St. Michel, which is both an island and mainland, located near Normandy, France, right here. And it's really an island and a fortress monastery a few hundred yards from land that is accessible at low tide, but strands with the assailants as the tide comes in. So in other words, this is what it looks like you can walk to it, but at the end of the day, you can't because of the tide. Uh, it has a permanent uh, above water causeway that tourists can walk to and take a, uh, take a look at. It. it work began in the 8th century and defended France in the Hundred Years' War and later became a prison and now it's a tourist destination. This is a bunch of photographs, a lot of people, tens of thousands of people come to this and you can see why. Now we're going to move on uh, to go uh, take a tour of a little bit of the solar system right now. Saturn rings, Saturn's rings are made of billions of chunks of ice that encircle the planet here. The chunks are thought to be material like comets, asteroids, space debris, or a moon that got too close to Saturn and broke up millions of years ago. The material in the ring weighs hundreds of trillions of tons in total. The rings are just really 100 yards thick, but go out to uh, 85,000 miles outwards. The Cassini spacecraft that orbited Saturn for a dozen years discovered huge mountains of ice debris in Saturn's V ring. This is our conception of it, but it found these mountains here that look exactly like this. Let's take a look at those mountains on the ring. These mountains are made of ice that are up to two miles high, and you can see their shadows here. So these are mountains two miles up in the air on the edge of a ring. Uh, and 800 million miles away from us where the temperature is negative 200 below zero. And they're 10,000 feet tall, so he just boggles my imagination. Also, Saturn has hexagonal cloud patterns shaped as a hexagonal cloud-shaped North Pole. Each side of the polygon is 8,000 miles long and can easily fit in two or three Earths. This natural otherworldly shape is 200 miles tall and it's really a jet stream made up of atmospheric gases traveling at over 200 miles per hour, which creates and keeps this unique shape. Who would have thought that, huh? And speaking of Saturn, this is one of its moons, Enceladus, that has cryovolcanoes on it. And that currently spews out geysers of water, ammonia, and methane into space at 800 miles per hour. This liquid then falls back to the surface and then is refrozen since fresh ice has been found there. There is a huge body of liquid water under this moon's surface, which is 20 miles thick, and the water there is 10 times deeper than our oceans there. And this is what it looks like uh, when you go by. That's how they know this is going on there. You can see these kind of spoons go up in the air. And they believe an ocean lies under there, uh, causing, uh, which is really, uh, there's, What's going on is there's constant tugging by Saturn's gravity, and this is called tidal heating or flexing, and this is what makes the water then come up, I'm sorry, come up into these, into these vents that shoot up in the air. And this ocean underneath this uh, ice might be heated uh, by, geo, by hydrothermal vents like those on Earth, so that where there's heat and liquid water, microbial life could exist like they do on Earth, on sulfur vents on Earth. So that's why scientists are excited about this. Lastly, in the solar system, we'll visit, um, uh, we'll, we'll jump to Pluto. There are hexagonal and polygonal shapes on this frozen and remote surface of Pluto. There are vast frozen nitrogen featureless plane exists where the ice is segmented with deep crevices separating blocks of glacial nitrogen. Scientists believe a semi-liquid ocean is below, is, is below this huge, um, well actually what they do is they think there's like this, um, they call it the heart of Pluto right here, it looks like a big heart, and underneath this is an ocean that they think that that might be underneath all this ice and frozen methane and nitrogen right here. So this results in um, 
infracturing on the surface than with this uneven heating and, and cooling on the surface. It is 380 degrees below zero on the surface of Pluto. These patterns are made in a world that is four and a half billion miles from us and takes nine years to travel to. And lastly, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, this is Mons Olympia, which is an ancient dormant shield volcano on Mars. It is the largest and tallest planetary volcano in the solar system and is 14 miles tall or 70,000 feet tall. That's two and a half times higher than Mount Everest. It is 370 miles wide. It's as big as the state of Arizona. It actually rises into the Mars atmosphere into space. This volcano is twice as high as commercial airplanes fly on Earth, and if placed on Earth, would rise into our stratosphere. So we have all these natural wonders on other planets and, and moons also in our solar system, which is what I wanted to bring your attention. And uh, we're going to jump now to South Korea. This is called Jeju Island, and it lies in the Korean Strait, south of the Korean Peninsula, uh, right here. And this place is really a playground for a lot of rich Asian families, particularly from South Korea. It is a winter destination for Asian tourists, much like Hawaii is for us. The island formed 70,000 years ago, and weathering and erosion over the years has helped shape the island. So there's this giant um, volcano here, and this is where people come and, and play, right like here. People come and play here, and they visit this area here. And it has a lot of features to it. People come there, and there are beaches to lie on, waterfalls to see, and boasts the world's largest lava tube, which is five miles long, which is right in, in tours of that. This tube was carved from ancient molten lava long ago. And we're going to stay in the uh, Mideast, and 200 miles off the coast of Yemen in the Arabian Sea, right here, is an island called Sokoto. On this island grows an evergreen tree called the Dragon's Blood Tree. It is so called from the red sap the tree produces. This tree has a densely packed crown, you can see here, having the shape of an uprightly held umbrella. Its leaves are only found at the end of its youngest branches. The tree is shaped this way as an adaptation to the prevalent and arid conditions with low amounts of soil. The large packed crown provides shade and reduces evaporation. So here are some other strangely uh, unique trees. This is the, oh, I lost my car keys tree. <laughs> And here is a, um, I guess what some of these are. Here is the, no oh, what's about a tree? The baby I'm hacking up and leaving you tree. This is old baby, please don't leave me tree. This is a modern art tree, eight meter tree. And this is the, oh, I shouldn't have had that third margarita at City Fire last night. So there are different kinds of trees. Uh, we're gonna jump now to Africa and stay there for a while. And in, during the last year's uh, spring and summer, hundreds of millions of locusts swarmed in East Africa, Ethiopia, Kenya, Yemen, and Somalia. This is a major threat to much needed irrigation land. So it occurred in these areas here, just in sub-Saharan Africa. And, and it chewed up everything that was on its way, the, the swarms of insects. One super storm in Kenya was 37 miles wide, by 25 miles long. And what's going on here, these are billions of locusts that hatch. And they come and invade like this, and this is what they get into. So these things destroy crops, it gets in everywhere, and they are a very big menace. They help them from almost a year of the grace of the sea. How late is Uh, 
rainforest nestled on top of this extinct volcano. It's a secret rainforest discovered by satellite imagery. And to get to the top, you must repel up to get there. There's 100 acres of rainforest up there. Very unique. And we're going to still stay in Africa and visit the Okavanga Delta in Botswana, which is a vast, swampy, shallow inland delta that starts north in Angola. And as the water spreads into Botswana, it forms a delta fan shape from seasonal flooding, which becomes, um, which later goes into the ground. That is, it gets evaporated. So it's like a big fan shape area of water that comes in from floods and floods an area like this. And what it really does is just to see it from space, it comes in like this. This is a massive area. It's a delta that forms from this massive flooding of like three billion gallons of water, like once a year. It's seasonal. And it forms a delta 155 miles wide by 93 miles long. And it's 6,000 square miles big. And what this does then, in this kind of area in Africa, once there's water, then things change. Then you get these kind of animals with this kind of water. You get hippos, you get gazelles and owls, you get lions chasing them. So this is where the action starts. It, so this is what attracts animals to the area. It's the water and the abundance of it. So some 200,000 large animals live around the area, and it has 2,500 hippos, zebras, giraffes, rhinos, crocodiles, baboons, cheetahs, hyenas, and bullbees. 400 species, 400 bird species live there, and even 70 fish species because of the water. Hordes of animals come to nest, hunt, wallow, drink, and graze. And it has 150,000 little islands because of this. This area is an oasis and a lifeline in an arid country and is a river that doesn't empty into a sea or other rivers, but into the sands of time. That is, it evaporates into the Kalahari Desert. These meandering river trails that you see here, how were they were formed? They were made by hippos that walk under underwater. The hippos walk on the, on the floor of this of the riverbed, and that's how they make these kind of trails. These are really hippo trails. So when the water all dries up, then, then it gets dry, and the hippos just walk on the land, and so do other animals that are left there. Yeah. And this dries up again in the dry season. Now we're going to switch gears and talk about something almost political, but not really. This is North Korea from space. And we're going to talk about the infamous and notorious country, North Korea. This is what it looks like in space because there's no lights there. We're the only country like this. That's right, no lights. Everybody knows that North Korea's missiles, but no one ever tells you what it's like in the country itself. One would expect um, cities like this, which is Pyongyang, and leaders like this to be shown. Pyongyang, by the way, is by the uh, south western part of the country there. And if you go there, you expect to see a communist country, big statues like this, soldiers, giant military parades, which we can all expect. However, living in North Korea means everything is censored and difficult to get anything out of the country. And no one ever tells you what it's like in the country itself. Because of the restrictions and sanctions, people can't get enough to eat, collect grass to eat, there's food, there's power shortages, where there's really no electricity for hours on end. Uh, the streets are usually devoid of, of traffic, so <coughs> kids play on them, because cars are really too expensive to own. There's no oil uh, <coughs> also to, uh, to make them go in the first place. And subways double as bomb shelters. However, in Poignang, uh, people live a, a fantastic life. Some of the elites living there, they live in very much luxury. But once you get outside into the rural areas, once you leave Point Yang and go into the vast hundreds of thousands of miles or hundreds, tens of thousands of square miles of countryside, then things are different. And also, they have a lot of censorship. Uh, just doing anything in a relaxed way is not to be photographed or shown. You always must be working really hard for the state and be in attention all the time. 
you know, little kids afraid of escalators. They've never seen them before. And since there's zero percent unemployment in North Korea, they don't like showing pictures of poverty. When children do this, and children working in collective fields are collecting. Also, they, when you hear their propaganda, children are very happy to work in the coal mines and eagerly go in them and eagerly work on these kind of situations. This is a common experience because there's little parts to get with no oil. And dusting is not photographed either, as we mentioned. And no oil means the streets are empty. It's kind of like living in a, in a ghost town in a way. And everybody's thin or gaunt regardless of age. Just notice that all the men dancing here, particularly all the women, are very thin. At the average age of living in uh, North Korea is 68 years old when people die. And they are slowly starved to death over the long run and work to death too. So no one, no one has a weight problem there. This is children collecting grain. And I'm showing you this. Why am I showing you this? Because it's fantastic that a country like this even exists in today's world. This is dog meat soup. This is a fake city by the DM military zone. And if you run there thinking you can get away from everything, you're just going to be caught. With, and this is meant to attract people like a big mouse trap. Uh, they have plans for luxury uh, resorts, but they're all um, facades of building, kind of like Hollywood sets with nothing behind them at all. It's all just one big illusion. The local school bus looks like this. And you might as well line up in the streets to take these uh, tram buses here that go on these electric lines because there's no one in the streets in the first place. Children. This is their plumbing. And cars are obviously too expensive to own. It's fantastic this kind of country still exists and the leaders have not been brought uh, to public uh, trial for unspeakable crimes. Now we're going to move on from North Korea and we're going to talk go into the Pacific the South Pacific, and talk about the uh, Bikini Atoll. Between 1946 and 1958, 23 nuclear weapons were detonated by the U.S. at seven test sites on the Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands in the uh, South Pacific. They're a very remote area, that's why they did them there. They were tested on the reef, in the air, and underwater. The Navy brought in 95 ships to be used for testing and it was a ship graveyard there now in the atolls that they have. Much of the area was destroyed. It actually used a bomb that was 1,000 times stronger there to test than the Hiroshima event. Currently, the area has a thriving ecosystem though and is an unplanned marine life sanctuary even with lingering low levels of radiation. So fish and coral have come back, but you don't want to eat the fish and you don't want to stay there and you don't want to eat much there at all. The atoll remains uninhabitable for humans with radiation levels well above the maximum for humans. The water, seafood, and plants are not safe to eat and the water to drink. The Marshall Islands population in general to, the, to this day has 60 times the cervical cancer mortality rate for females with high rates of lung, breast, leukemia, thyroid, gastrointestinal cancer, for both men and women. So we did test them out there, but the people living there paid the price. And speaking of strange events in the Pacific, this is the great uh, Pacific garbage patch, which exists between Hawaii and California. And it contains two trillion plastic pieces weighing in 100,000 metric tons. This floating uh, garbage is an eyesore, and even worse for marine animals, Oh, like sea turtles that take them and then choke on them, things like that. This makes you think twice about our, our throwaway society. So this is a great vortex of this. This also occurs in a little bit in the Mediterranean, the Atlantic, and even in the Indian Ocean, we have these kind of problems with the, with the amount of garbage. Because plastic, plastic doesn't really degrade over time that, in, in the water like that. And speaking of the most furthest and farthest uh, southern island, 
This is it, South Pacific Island. That was supposed to be a joke. And, that's <laughs> and we're going to jump now to uh, uh, Russia and the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in the Ukraine exploded in April of 1986 and had a meltdown due to its design flaws. The reactor contained 180 tons of uranium dioxide and no containment building to stop its release from the resulting fire. The fire burned for 10 days, resulting in huge amounts of radioactive materials into the air that spread all over Northern Europe. 20,000 square miles were contaminated with over 300,000 people were eventually were relocated. So what used to look like this became this, a before and after. It was a very beautiful place in the Ukraine, uh, mainly for factory workers and people and farmers who work in the area, who live in the area. But now it looks like this, and it's really a ghost town. And you can only stay there a few hours in Chernobyl, and then you should leave. What was left is really uh, something right out of a movie set of the dystopian film. And what, what happened there was that radiation levels were 90 times higher than the Hiroshima event, and a vast cloud of radioactivity pulsed through Northern Europe. This incident caused 36 direct casualties, but really it was a disaster in the making because 4,000 people died of radiation sickness and uh, disaster-related illnesses. The former plant will not be habitable for 20,000 years, and the reactor is now encased in steel and concrete. The area is a ghost town that you can see here. And even the animals that live near it have been deformed. Currently, a mole thriving on low-level radiation exists there. This disaster of an event was one of the many reasons the Soviet Empire collapsed in 1991. There was a complete lack of uh, there was a, a transparency involved in this with the Russian government. They didn't tell people correctly, and people weren't evacuated properly, and this was a super disaster. And this is what it looks like. Here's a, a woman putting out photographs of the people that have died there. So this is a classroom right here. You can see what kind of mess this made. Now we're going to jump uh, to the Atlantic, and speaking Excuse of disasters, we're going to visit the Titanic. Excuse me. Yes, sir. There is an excellent book about Chernobyl written by a guy named Adam Higginbotham. Okay. It is very thick. It is very detailed. It tells you exactly how the whole thing happened from the beginning of the explosion, mm -hmm. and it's just blows you away when you read the account of the people that were physically there mm -hmm. and what they suffered through, you know. Exactly. The, the, the workers are, uh, the workers are, were uh, hospitalized. They had to put a big concrete dome yep. over the whole thing. They're on their third one now. Their third, uh, whatever they call it, uh, dome over it. Too. And even that one's being eaten out from the inside. <laughs> Thank you for telling us. I, I appreciate control that. The atomic power. Yeah. You can. Well, well, they made a mistake with their the, the, uh, their reactor, and they they paid the price for yeah. this one. Thank you for saying that. Next, we'll go to the uh, North Atlantic, right here where the Titanic sank. It uh, sank in April of 1912, uh, about 370 miles southeast of Newfoundland. It came to rest in two places on an abyssal plain at 12,600 feet uh, deep with a pressure of 400 atmospheres. That means that the Titanic is 6,000 PSI over every part of the ship. Then it's down there. The bow section is completely recognizable with its preserved interiors, but the stern is a third of the mile away and is completely ruined. All of her wood has been eaten by C4 worms and bacteria. As the Titanic was sinking, it split into two parts with the bow hitting the bottom at 23 miles an hour and burrows 60 feet deep, or up to its anchor in the mud. However, the sinking stern section still had air in it, and this caused it to implode on its descent, causing damage, catastrophic damage. The, the debris then all pancaked on top of each other, and the hull plating splayed out. The debris field covers two square miles and consists of thousands of objects like bowls, uh, suitcases, 
cold, bathtub, and personal effects. The newly discovered rust-eating bacteria is causing rapid decay of the ship, which is rusting away. So it's slowly rusting away. They think by the end of the century it won't, it won't be there. But it left all these images here. And I wanted to focus on this pocket watch here because there is an attempt to salvage uh, items from, from the wreck. Uh, the United States and, and Britain declared this a memorial uh, to be left alone. Now they want to uh, uh, salvage the wireless radio from the wreck and put it in the museum. You can also buy small artifacts recovered from the site, like pieces of coal. But this place is really a, a graveyard and should be left in peace. How would you like it if your grandfather's watch or great-grandfather's watch was left on display uh, and, and, or items from the ship that one of your families went on was sold on eBay? We're going to uh, go now and jump to uh, what is brought to, brought to you by the uh, village's underwater um, basket weaving park. <laughs> well, they produce more bubbles and less talk. <laughs> so we're going to jump to Russia right now. And this is the uh, Lena Stone Forest in Far Eastern Siberia. Uh, the Lena Pure Pillar. And these pillars are 500 to 1,000 feet tall and formed 500 million years ago. They are on the banks of the Lena River in Siberia. They extend 50 miles alongside paralleling this river and consist of alternating layers of limestone, dolomite, slate, and formed from, an ancient, formed from ancient marine sediments. The region's extreme climate and humidity uh, from the river created huge temperatures Swings at between 80 degrees in the summer and 50 below in the winter time. This freeze thaw action shatters the rock and widens the gullies between them, isolating them to the spirit pillars. And this exists in uh, eastern, Sib in eastern Siberia. And we're going to still stay in Siberia for a while now. We talked about the uh, uh, Kudurana Plateau, which is a mountainous area. 25,000 lakes and is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's 7,300 miles big and no one knows anything about it. No one ever talks about Siberia, but it's gorgeous in the summer and has these dramatic vistas, but deadly in the winter and kind of reminds you very much of Alaska. But it's so isolated that really no one goes there. And in Siberia also is the Mali Symmetric Volcano, which is a short two mile long volcanic range in Siberia. It's 17,000 years ago, its caldera collapsed, and a large lake formed in the open 2,000 foot of caldera. And if a large lake formed in the open of this with its tall, steep slide, sides. The interior has a colorful lake with a diameter of 600 yards over 200 feet deep. Its green turquoise color is caused by sulfur and other poisonous elements emitted by underwater vents, plus it's very salty. Now I wanted to show you this because it's very dramatic to see something like this. And we're going to still stay in uh, Siberia. Picture here of the Gulags in Russia and Siberia. From 1920s to the early 1950s, up to 18 million men and women were sent here by the Stalin regime as a way to punish political rivals, lawbreakers, dissidents, and farmers who would not work their land in the collective state. And they would stay in these kind of housing units. This is them working and being in barracks. It's kind of like prisons, but outside. This is what it would look like in there. Uh, Solzhenitsyn wrote about this in the late 70s called famous book, anyone who is surprised by it. And uh, toiling in super harsh conditions, these prisoners built canals and railroads for the state. Millions died from starvation, overworking, and freezing conditions. This is like an archipelago of, of these of the work chain events. And I wanted to oh, take the time to show you something. Uh, here are workers making a canal. Tens of thousands of workers built this canal and went from the Baltic Sea to a, uh, the city. Here they are burying a comrade from Old work, from Old work. Here's a gold mine that they had operation in Siberia where they had these people working. This is Stalin visiting the area. And you notice the hammer and sickle? Well, they're using that hammer.
hammer in the uh, in making these. Uh, this is how the infrastructure of Russia was built: the canals and the railroads. They built them with their own people, who were, in their opinion, lawbreakers. That's how this got built. And these are the gulags, by the way. Uh, this is um, we were actually hundreds, dozens or hundreds of them drawn scattered all through Europe. And that's where they were located. In case you want to picture that. This is like an archipelago or a chain of little work camps all over Russian controlled areas. And speaking of uh, dictators, etc., this is Putin's palace. Uh, this just made the news this summer. He has built a huge house here worth reportedly over a billion dollars and a huge estate uh, just for him. And this is what it looks like on the inside. So if you want to know if one of the richest men in the world live, this is where he lives. We're going to move now to uh, the Vietnam the Laos area. And this is called the Hang Sun Dong Cave in Vietnam. It's really on the border between Laos Vietnam. Okay. And it's one of the world's largest caves. It was discovered by accident in 1991. I read about this in National Geographic and I was fascinated by this because the main cave passage is three miles long and the height is 660 feet. That's over two football fields stood on end. And it's 500 feet wide. You could easily drive a large plane through this. And in a few areas, the ceiling of the cave has collapsed, letting in light, resulting in a mini rainforest inside the cave. It boasts an underground river and the world's tallest stalagmites, over 200 feet tall. What a unique discovery. And it looks like this. That would be fascinating to see. Actually, you can take tours of it, but uh, during the rainy season, it floods a lot and you can't get in. And speaking of caves, this is uh, Ice Reisenwald, which is a natural cave limestone ice cave in Weffern, uh, Austria, and it's located in the Hochschild Mountains in the Alps, right here in uh, northern Austria, it is, and is the largest ice cave in the world. It extends over 20 miles, but tourists see the first kilometer of it. This cave was formed by a nearby river that eroded passageways in the mountain, and the ice formations in the cave were formed by falling snow drained into the cave and froze during the winter. This would be fascinating to take a tour of, as you can see right here. I'd love to go there. And staying with ice, and I thought I'd throw this in, this is ice climbing, climbing ice waterfalls. You can climb them in Canadian Rockies or Colorado and Wyoming using crampons or spikes on shoes and an ice pick and a rope with special climbing gear and clothes. This is what people do. This is an extreme sports situation. There are two kinds of ice climbing, alpine and waterfall. Waterfall ice is vertical frozen water. This is really a frozen waterfall attached solidly to its ice base and then appears to be bonded to a supporting wall of rocks, which is safe and more stable as long as the ice is cold and strong. Clearly, these ambitious climbers risk everything to make their reach higher than their grasp. Now we're going to, speaking of ice, we're going to jump to Antarctica. And Antarctica is really, uh, it's 5 million square miles. It's twice as large as Australia and is the coldest, windiest, driest, highest continent and is really considered a desert because of this situation. And it has many interesting features. This is a sand dune there. It wasn't blown in, but this is what's left over from the glacier deposited this and left uh, right underneath it and then built up this kind of uh, area of sand. This is blood falls in Antarctica where uh, iron oxide deposit has made the area red and flowed into the water. This in Antarctica is Lake, Lake Vostok and above Antarctica, well, Antarctica has, in places, 13,000 feet of ice. That's two and a half miles of ice. And underneath this, they found a lake that has liquid water in it, one of the deepest and biggest lakes, and it's called Lake Vostok, 
And there's a gorge here that rivals the Grand Canyon coming around this lake. So beneath all these layers of ice, is a lake underneath, and I thought that was really fantastic to hear about. They're trying to drill in there. Russia's trying to drill in there right now and trying to see what, what's going on down there. Are there little microorganisms or not? Maybe there's algae? We don't know. But that would be a condition that would be uh, uh, wonderful to hear about if they were to get down there. And lastly, we're going to visit, almost lastly, Iceland, which is a volcanic island. And it has all these waterfalls, and I got fascinated by these waterfalls, and also the geothermal activity in Iceland. This is Gullfoss, Gullfoss and, uh, a waterfall on the coast in, in Iceland here. It's 105 feet tall and divided into two waterfalls. And the melting ice and rain all drops down to the ocean. This is the Gullfoss waterfall. And these are pictures right out of a calendar that is, uh, you put on your refrigerator. And this is the Stoker ball, a geyser that erupts six to, every six to 10 minutes with a height of 50 to 65 feet. This is really a geothermal valley in Iceland and visited by tourists. And this is what it looks like. And there's all these kinds of waterfalls there and I just thought I'd show you this to them because they just fascinate me. This is Salandavas uh, waterfall in southern Iceland where the water drops 200 feet. Imagine seeing that. These are other kind of waterfalls there. Uh, the Gadafoss waterfall. Uh, Denafoss waterfall. Imagine standing right about here and looking at this thing. Uh, the Selfoss waterfall. And the Skagavos waterfall is fascinating because this takes me to tell us because this has, on full moon nights, this has a moon ball. Instead of a regular moon ball, lit up by the uh, full moon. Also with the aurora borealis, you really get a colorful sight on full moon night. A moon ball. And because Iceland is between two tectonic plates, you can dive right between them salt of the tissue. We get one plate here, the radiant plate. This is another Pacific plate right here. Atlantic plate. And you can also go inside glaciers with man-made ones you can go inside them. This is the uh, Lankinjol glacier and the Banatnikol glacier, which I just pronounced. And there are places where man-made ice tunnels go hundreds of feet inside the glacier. Once inside is a half mile a kilometer of a half kilometer uh, area of tunnels bored into ice that you can take uh, guided tours of. So this is a man-made place where they use machines to cut out areas inside the glacier, inside a southern uh, portion of Iceland the glacier park. You can take tours of that. And there's also a, this kind of situation. This really about sums up what I wanted to uh, share with you concerning faraway places that are fantastic and explains our perception of our world and other worlds. But of course, the most fantastic place to be <laughs> is always have to get there. And thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, before I take your questions, there are other slides after this that we can show you. I have a mini show, but uh, if anybody has any questions, Please feel free to bring up whatever you wish or talk about. Are there any questions or comments? Yes, sir. I, I just want to talk about the, the ice moon. We went a couple of years ago, yeah. and the reason that they did that, the environmentalists don't like it, but the economy in Iceland is so bad, they were hurting for money, so they opened it up. They drilled a hole into the glacier. You take a, uh, I want to say not even a half track, it's a big, they call it Bigfoot big truck to go up there and we went in there and they give you uh, grip ons for your feet and everything you walk around and, and it's kind of coldish but it wasn't too bad well we were going up and we passed this road and it said don't you can't go that way don't enter yeah so we had to go around a different way right because of the uh, snow and whatever it snows almost every day there we were in Reykjavik you could see it sure and uh, coming back the uh, 
the bus drivers or the truck drivers said, well, we're running late, we're gonna go down that road anyway. So we went around the, the do not cross signs and we're going down and went, the, the truck has real wheels, it's like a half track or whatever. And we're going through there, we come across a car on the side of the road with three nuts of uh, English speaking Germans who did the same thing. They were just a rental car. Oh. So all the men had to get off of the, off of the truck and, we, and it was pulled by another one. It was literally a tractor and a trailer. The drivers were up front and you could see through our windows looking up the front. We got, oh, by the way, when we left, there was a blizzard. Really? We got stuck in a blizzard. So we, we get out, we help these guys, and they put them on our thing, and they hooked up the car to the back of the track and dragged it out. Okay. But the funny thing is, when we got there, we pulled up, and he said, okay, we're here. And we, we're looking around. All you see is a blue tarp on the side of a hill. Oh. And they go over, they open up the tarp, and it's, it's the entrance into that's the caves. Right <laughs> and that's it right there. That's the one we went into. Is that where it shows all those chairs is the chapel. <laughs> Oh, yeah. They have different rooms there, and they have they have lighting the way it's set up so that it's it's beautiful to see. And then the, uh, some of the water will be dripping down from the sea. Sure. You look up into these crevices ah. and see the, the blue because it's not absorbed by the uh, atmosphere or whatever. It was just a fantastic thing. The thing is, we were going to Europe, and we were on Iceland Air. And the deal with Iceland Air is if you go on that, you have to stop in Iceland. And they. It could be over, they try to get you to stay overnight, so they're offering like three days to stay there. Mm -hmm. And you, you could, some people are staying a week because you, you, there's only one road that goes around the whole area, the whole island. But we stayed right around the Yacht Rick and took side trips. We didn't rent the car. Yeah, you can't rent the car. Yeah, you can't rent the car. Can't rent the the car. It's, it's good to have that experience yeah. when it comes to these things. It was, a, it was an amazing, some place you think, I'm never going to go to Iceland. Why would I go there? I loved it. It was it was fantastic. Well, that's great. It does look like this. Yeah. Does anybody have any other comments or questions? Now I'll show you my little little thing. I collect these things over the summer. I thought it'd be kind of cool. This is a red sprite. These are uh, they made it at the very top of our our uh, after a thunder during a thunderstorm. You can zip for hundreds of miles and there's a flash of light that looks like this. You can see this from space, by the way. These are fire tornadoes. Uh, sometimes when the wind whips up, you can have a tornado made of fire. <laughs> this is what a dust storm looks like up on the, in the Phoenix. And that's pretty dramatic. Uh, these are sea forts off of, um, in Britain, in the North Sea. You can live in them, uh, they're like condos. So they made them into condos or some kind of areas to live in. So there were once, um, I think, uh, some kind of a situation about uh, the mountain sea, sea barracks out there. And this is in Dubai. And you got it. And they have made uh, islands that they have made. So look at the shape, you can see this. One in the shape of the world, you see that? Like that. And uh, speaking of islands, and this is in the news right now. Yeah. This is uh, China's building in the Spratly Islands. They're actually building islands themselves by using extra sand and then putting them on so they could make naval bases, uh, uh, airplane strip, uh, landing, place. landing place, thank you. And this is hotly contested uh, by the right between the Philippines and uh, the mainland there. <coughs> These are shadows about the atomic bombs uh, in uh, the, the uh, Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki area. And uh, the fire hydrant left a, with a child skipping rope uh, it left into a shadow. The shadow of a person about to climb stairs with a cane. Shadow of a person with a ladder, all done from nuclear bombs. This is a Fukushima plant. There are monkeys now living in the area where the Fukushima meltdown happened about six or seven years ago. And they don't mind, they're irradiated, but no one's gonna be there, so they have to place them themselves. This is again another ice cave. This is in Jasper National Park where you can go inside a, but it's natural, inside a, a real one. That's what the entrance looks like. You can go in there. And this is a reverse zoo in South Africa. 
I, I read about it, I knew about this. How does this happen? So you pay to go in to these little cages, and then the lions come up to you and check you out. How about like that? Yes. Shark and, they, yeah. And, yeah. and they just sit there looking at you just like this. Wow. No, thank you. <laughs> I think that's fun. Oh, yeah. That would be cool. Yeah. We'll put you in the cage. Uh, that is from <laughs> yeah. Rayard in Wyoming. Wow. Uh, they find all these skeletons there, uh, fossils of ancient animals. And these are something that is in astronomy. Um, neutron stars are really cores of old stars. And when they come together like this, they collide, they create materials that are on this earth, like platinum or gold. So the neutron stars collided, they created the gold, and during the heavy bombardment period, about four billion years ago, they came to Earth and came in, inside our Earth, and that's how we got gold. So when you ever see gold, it came from, it's four billion years old, and it doesn't come really from here at all. It comes from out of space. When they collide, this happens inside of your gold. And, and, and a number of other materials, too. This is the avenue of the bail bonds in, um, in Madagascar, they have a whole uh, lime tree area. You walk down, and these trees are 20 or 30 feet uh, wide, and they're very unique looking. I just thought that's fascinating. And they store water. And they, they, yeah. that's correct, very good. Thank you for saying that. They do store water that way, actually thousands of gallons of water inside them. And a very unique kind of a tree. The locals have learned to tap into them. It's almost like getting maple, you know, sap out of a tree. Yeah. You'll see that the locals have created a, a place to go get water in your life. I'm very glad you said that because I would have forgot to say that. You are correct. And it's a great place to get this on Madagascar. This is the one of the largest islands in the world. And on Madagascar, yeah. they have this, this teensy stone forest there, which is eroded limestone thing. It goes up to 150 feet tall. And lemurs jump on these things, and then they go down in the crevices to get the food. But they use them like stepping stones, and they jump from place to place. <clears throat> There's over a hundred species, different kinds of species of lemurs on Madagascar. And this ocean fire from a broken gas line. I thought that was fascinating. I saw this fire and water. And here's a cave that you can go into. Uh, I think it's on like um, one of these South Pacific, uh, like around um, Borneo or Sumatra. It's Borneo, right up there, Borneo. Borneo, thank you for telling me, I lost <laughs> track. And there's all these thousands of bats, that, tens of thousands, actually more than hundreds of thousands of bats that lived there for a long time. They lived there so much that there's a, uh, in their bat droppings, it's 100 feet tall and free from their droppings and little insects and other things congregate on these things and then exist on this. It's a mini ecosystem based on bat droppings inside these huge caves inside Borneo. And it looks like this. This is just as big as the Vietnam cave that we saw. I thought that was fascinating to have these little insects around like this. This is a ship graveyard in Australia. Visit this. That was fascinating. And in the Cayman Islands, you can go there in the in the uh, Western Antilles, and you can uh, pet uh, stingrays there. And it's an uh, open area. The stingrays like it because they get a lot of attention and maybe some food. <laughs> Stingray on in Grand Cayman. And this is in um, uh, the Tis uh, Lake in Croatia, one of the most beautiful places in the world, but no one knows anything about it. And I just thought it looks like something out of a dream. Yeah. And it does because it looks, besides, look at all these waterfalls. There must be a, two dozen of them here. And it looks like this. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that is, it's a, it's a park you can go to, but it's, it's it, like in southern Slovenia. And here's the cave of the swallow. Oh, you can actually yeah. jump into it, and it's a thousand feet deep, and then have a parachute to catch you. Well, there's, there's a free fall area you can jump into. And that got me fascinated. I love all these extreme sports things. Now, when it's the Cave of Swallows, is that are those one of the caves that the locals go into to get the, um, uh, the, the bird's bird, bird nest, nest to make bird nests? We think so. Okay. Yes, there is something on that. Yes. 
and they go in there and collect that. Yeah, it looks like that same little, kind of little birds go in there, they make these nests, but the nest's hard enough, and then they take them, they're like the crystalline structure, and then they take them and make soup out of them. Mm -hmm. So they Some risk their lives restaurants. to get this Some stuff. Some of the restaurants for lots of money. Oh, lots, lots of money. They have to go on ladder, rickety ladders and climb up real high the natives there to get these things. And it's really <laughs> scary. Uh, these are red crabs in Cuba. They come out and they, they're in there and they, they just come out and they go everywhere to try and get to, to water. And, and these just run right over them. Nope. Yeah, but they lay their eggs in the water and they live on land. They have to get to the water yeah. to put their eggs in the water. Uh, but, if they, but if they go in the water, they'll drown. So, so they have to lay their eggs and then get the hell out of there. Go to the water. Well, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> That's the most important part. I should forget that. Yeah. This is a punch hole cemetery in Oahu, but they made a, um, a cemetery there on top of a ancient volcano. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating. I thought that was a unique way to use yeah. land. And this is, a, you don't hear much about Cuba, but there is a, a, a Coral Sea National Park there, the corals there. What's going on is half the world's coral now has been under stress and been bleached because of the warming of the ocean water along with more acidic acid in the water. And this has caused a lot of corals, particularly uh, in here and in the Great Coral uh, Reef, um, uh, in Australia, the Great Barrier Reef, <laughs> which will be in, uh, by the way, Exotic Island. <laughs> and this is, um, the bats come out of hundreds of thousands of them, and they go into these caves that we're talking about. But these are in the Yucatan Peninsula. These are called uh, cenotes uh, in the Yucatan, and you can dive into them. These are places where fresh water exists. You know, the Mayans built these fantastic temples, but where did they get their water from? There weren't any rivers there, but there's all these, in the Yucatan, there's all these places called snows, which are big areas of water. Mm -hmm. And you can dive into them, and it looks like this. Isn't that fascinating? Look at the hole up here. And that, you get your water if you go or a bucket into them, by the way. And you can also dive into them, and this is called Hallocene diving. And you dive into them, and these snows are by the, um, by the ocean water. So salt water comes in underneath and then there's fresh water on top. And this creates a two-layer system where it actually has an optical illusion called halocenes, which look like this. This is actually the salt water and this is fresh water above them. He's not on the surface, he's underwater. And I thought that was fascinating. It kind of looks like this. Fresh water on top, salt water that's heavier on the bottom. I thought that was interesting. And Jim's Horn House in uh, Montana, 16,000 antlers you can go and visit in a big shed. And I thought this was really interesting. Imagine going there. How would you, oh, I'm glad I'm blocking your view all this time. I'm totally sorry. I didn't feel like I should have been more to the side here. Okay. Uh, imagine going into this. And whatever it is, don't be drunk and then slip and fall. <laughs> That's for sure. Okay. And this is him pissed up again. Looks like something out of a nightmare, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 Gives me the creep looking at So these are, I see little things on the net that come up and I say, oh, I'm going to take a picture of Maybe you guys would like to see. We'll find out. And I think that's all I have because I'm out of stuff. <laughs> so thank you for coming thank and that's all I Thank you. Sure, I hope you enjoyed that. Oh, there you go. Yeah, next week, yeah. Incredible yeah. Journeys. Yeah. You, if you come to Incredible Journeys next week, I guarantee there are 10 journeys you've never heard of before. Wow. <laughs> Thanks for coming, guys. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see some of you again. Yeah. yeah. We'll see you next week. <laughs> see you Friday. Oh, yeah. Is that a square or something? Uh -huh. We'll be here. And say, where do I know her? Uh -huh.